we're going to go ahead and begin tonight. We have a lot of material to cover tonight. Just to start a minute or two early this evening, we have some announcements we'd like to make first. We understand that uh, Faye Toller has been moved to Hillview Terrace on Perry Hill. She's in room 304. She'll be there for a few weeks of rehab. Um, Missy Jones had surgery, and it was very successful this morning. And the prognosis was good. She should be at St. Vincent's in Birmingham for about three to four days. Pam Brenneman had a successful disc surgery yesterday at Baptist South, and seems it may have been the cause of the leg issues that she's been having. Uh, our sister Tammy Stedham is at home recovering well, uh, considering everything that she's gone through, and she may learn the results, the test results, in uh, the next uh, 10 days or so. Grace Wright, we understand, is back home and is feeling, and our prison ministry hygiene item is toothpaste, so please bring some of those uh, hygiene items so that uh, Mike over here can take them to the uh, prisoners in, in, the, uh, in the ministry that he's working with. <clears throat> we welcome everybody tonight, especially those, of course, those who are online. We have quite a few online, and we're glad that you're here as well. Let's begin tonight with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together to study your word and to look at how archaeology illuminates the Bible. Father, we pray for those that we just mentioned that are in need of our prayers. We pray that we will continue to keep them in our prayers and assist them in any way possible. Father, we thank you for the eternal truth that you've given to us. Help us, Father, to all be diligent students of your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Tonight is the last night of this series of lessons, started in March. And um, beginning next Wednesday night, uh, Brother Fincher Northern will begin uh, lessons, Thy Will Be Done is the topic for, for next week. And Thy Will Be Done, I'm sure that Brother Northern has some good information for us, and we need to uh, be present for that. Tell Bet Shemesh. Tell Bet Shemesh is an interesting place, to say the least. We're not going to get through. There is so much material that I've been able to accumulate um, over the last several years, since 2006, made six trips to this um, mound in Israel. We're going to take a look in the Bible where it's found. Big part of it's found in 1 Samuel 6. Tell simply means mound, hill. I have to remember that one civilization built on top of another in, in those ancient days. Bet means house in, is in um, Hebrew, and Shemesh means sun. So it's house of the sun is the way that, the, um, that, the, that it's phrased and the way the Canaanites, of course, um, phrased it. Before I go any further, I have another artifact. It is the oldest artifact that I have. It is one that was purchased by the Israeli Antiquities Authority, and I've always wanted one, but I could only afford this size <laughs> because these items are, they're not plentiful, and, and they are very expensive, especially the larger ones. But this is a tablet, and we've talked about these before in the last few months. And I'm going to hold it up so the camera over here can get a good bead on it. And it, you can come up and look at it. It's small, so the people at, uh, at home can, can see this as well. This is a cuneiform tablet written in, um, in cuneiform. I, I, I think this is Akkadian, but I'm not sure the alphabet that they, they've used. These were how they would pass on uh, information. Just like we would write a letter, put it in an envelope and seal it and mail it. These little tablets would come in this size and much larger. And sometimes they take the small ones like this and put it inside of a larger tablet so you'd get what was on the outside as well as the little tablet on the inside. Now when I uh, talk to the, and on the other side it's worn, but it's, it's a Babylonian tablet. 
dated about 2000 BC. It's what the authenticity uh, people there, the papers that they gave me at Israeli Antiquities Authority there in Jerusalem. And that would be uh, prior to Abraham that this was made. So that's old. And it's very um, precious um, to me. I haven't found, I have taken a microscope. I've taken a, uh, I've taken a real close look at this uh, with um, magnifying glass and other things. Got my Acadian book out, but I'm still at base zero. <laughs> and so it's not easy, as Dr. Bailey will tell you. So I have no idea what it says. It could be an agreement about cattle. It could be uh, something else uh, of some sort of a, 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 a receipt I, I, or a message of some sort. I don't know. But sometime in the future, I hope to find somebody much smarter than I that will be able to decipher this and tell me what it says um, from prior to Abraham. So I'm going to leave this up here so you can come up here and take a look at this small item. I laid on the white paper there so it'll be easy to find. Now, my question tonight as we get into Bet Shemesh is what do a queen, Egypt, the Philistines, the Canaanites, and the Israelites all have in common? And as you think about that, I'll give you the quick answer. They all hung out at Bet Shemesh. <laughs> Those are the four civilizations that you find at Tel Bet Shemesh. Bet Shemesh is south about 12 miles of south of Jerusalem and west, south and southwest of Jerusalem. Now, yes, they all hung out at Bet Shemesh. And in 1 Samuel 6 is where you'll find the, um, one of the main stories. But there are others. Here's a picture, an aerial picture taken a long time ago of the tell. Now, it's different now because this highway that you see right here has been widened in the last three or four years. This down here in the bottom center is the tell. Um, it's about seven acres as you see as you go around this tell. Down here is where we have been digging since 1990. Um, uh, I started in 06. And over here at the bottom you'll see the fields. Chickpeas are grown there. Hummus is what uh, that, that they use that for. And you can see part of the town of Bet Shemesh. Uh, it's grown quite a bit now. This is where Netanyahu grew up. This is his hometown, former prime minister of, of Israel. And uh, it has grown tremendously as well over 110,000 people in that town. Here's a map. As you take a look at it, you'll see Bet Shemesh right there in the middle of the, of the picture. And you'll see Gaza on the left, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, and Gath over here in the green. Those are the five cities of the Philistines. The middle part that is the light brown is called the Shephelah. It's called that in the Bible. Very lush, very uh, productive land. Lachish toward the bottom. Uh, we have a lot of stories about that. Then you'll get into where Jerusalem is and the, the Judean hills. And then over there beyond Jerusalem in the area of the white is, of course, um, more of the Judean hills, but also um, the Dead Sea, um, and, of course, beyond that is Jordan. So that kind of gives you an idea. Bet Shemesh is right there in the middle of the, uh, of the country. That Bet Shemesh, you'll see as you're standing there looking out over the, uh, from the dig site, you'll see the field. Up there at the top, you'll notice the ridge of, uh, uh, of, of trees, and you'll notice about halfway down, not quite, way up there at the top, you'll see up here that odd-looking tree off by itself. That area that we've been to up there is where they tell us that Samson and his father are buried. There's a big tomb up there, and that's what they say, that's what they tell us. Um, and you'll see the, this object over here is the total station that looks like a surveyor's tool uh, that's used to, of course, calibrate and find. If you find something, they have to pinpoint it in the dig site, put it in the computer, and all of those things. Another story. Here's another uh, picture of, of what we've just seen uh, there. This is the same 
valley, the Sikor Valley, where Samson roamed. Where Samson roamed. Uh, if you'll go back here to the left of that valley, you'll be going back toward the Mediterranean Sea in that direction, back toward east. And just a few miles down the road is Timna. Timna is just a, a big tell, just a big mound. And that's where I understand Samson got his first Philistine wife. Here's another picture of uh, uh, industry around the tell area and so forth. You'll notice there is a wire in the middle with an with a, uh, uh, orange uh, flag uh, tied to it. Um, and uh, that is, um, was there before we got there. You know, the Jews are only allowed on the Sabbath to travel so far. You'll find some of these markings all over Israel. Uh, they were only allowed to travel thus far, and that marks that area. At the bottom of the tell is a Bedouin. The Bedouin lives there during the summer. During the wintertime, he takes his tent, his family, <coughs> and his Toyota pickup truck. They drive down to Beersheba, Arad, in the southern part of Israel, and that's where they spend the wintertime. In the summertime, they're up there uh, in the middle part of the country. He raises sheep and goat. His wife is covered from head to toe. Um, and um, Mike and I were talking earlier about the tea that they offer you. He'll come up there and offer us some tea. Of course, he watches the tell at night uh, and keeps an eye on it because there's thieves around everywhere wanting to, you know, get some of the artifacts and this sort of thing. But if you ever had any of that Israeli tea from Bedouins, it comes in a little glass about this big with no handle. It's hot as hot can be. And to me, it tastes like 40-weight motor oil. But um, others enjoy it. Uh, here's another picture of that, um, of that tent that he sets up. He works part of that field sometimes and earns some money. He'll raise his lambs and uh, his goats, and he'll slaughter them, and he'll take them into the city of Beth Shemesh or Jerusalem, and he'll sell them to others. This tell um, in 1911 to 1912 was first explored by Duncan McKenzie, Palestinian uh, exploration fund there at Bet Shemesh. When he began digging, now this is back in the primitive days of archaeology, this listing here of the reoccupation, first, second, third city, this is what he found. Well, uh, this is what he explored. Now you'll see here, when you look at him, he is sitting on a, um, uh, Duncan is, is kind of sitting on a, on a rock. He was quite tall and he didn't want to overshadow the other person that was photographed with him. Now, he explored this area and he, what he found, he thought was the strong wall. But of course, when he, they find these things, a lot of times they would rebury them. And then others, and many years later, have to come along and search for them. In 1928 to 1933, this area was excavated again by Yuli Grant uh, there at Bet Shemesh. And you can see the excavation that took place from 1933 to 1990, it stood dormant. Nobody touched that, that tell. Bet Shemesh from 33 to, to uh, 1990. But as Grant and Wright excavated, they found uh, a different strata, and they identified it as Iron Age and, uh, and so forth, late Middle Bronze and so forth. Those are their identifications of the, uh, of the site. Here's a drawing of the site, and then in the brown, well, almost orange, you can see the 1939, uh, uh, 1933 and 29 area here. Over here, you'll see the 1931 area, and then you'll see 1911 and 12 areas that were excavated. But we were up here in the gray areas, areas A, B, C, and D. And then, of course, McKenzie's wall was found later on that went around that seven-acre tell. It's mentioned in the Bible a number of times. In Joshua 15, the territorial boundary of Judah. Joshua 19, the tribal allotment of Dan. 
It was a Levitical town in the list in Joshua 21 and 1 Chronicles 6. The return of the Ark of the Covenant from the Philistines, 1 Samuel 6. Very interesting story that can be read uh, in your Bible. King Solomon's district, described in 1 Kings 4. Um, Jehoash and Amaziah at Beth Shemesh, they had, a, they had a battle there. It's recorded in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. And then, of course, the Philistines captured the uh, Beth Shemesh in the days of Uzziah uh, there in 2 Chronicles 28. Those are the biblical references to this site. So when you read these references, you'll see Beth Shemesh, and now you're going to see more of what Beth Shemesh is all about as we hurriedly go along here. Uh, in 1 Samuel 6, we know the story well where the Philistines had, um, had uh, God, th they captured the Ark of the Covenant. They had a battle with the Israelites. Israelites lost. Philistines captured it. They kept it over there uh, in, in their cities. And Ekron was the last city. And they put the, uh, God put plagues upon them. Uh, in the Bible, uh, I believe in the Hebrew, it says one of the plagues is tumors. Uh, and that's been interpreted as meaning hemorrhoids. So they really put some bad plagues, uh, God did, upon these Philistines. They had enough of it. They wanted to give the, um, the Ark of the Covenant back to the Israelites. They put it on a, a, um, a cart, a wooden cart, and they put two milk cows yoked together on the cart. They had pinned up their calves, and they put it on the way on the road to Beth Shemesh. They hid these five kings of the Philistines to watch it where it went, and it went right to the field that you saw uh, there at Beth Shemesh in that area. And then, of course, there were some of the men there touched it, and they died. It was shortly after that that David moved it up to uh, outside of Jerusalem. And uh, Samson, he's the boy that uh, grew up in this area. We can read about his story because he roamed that valley. And then, of course, uh, King Hezekiah and King uh, Sennacherib of, of, uh, of Assyria, uh, he, Sennacherib came up against these fortified cities, had a battle, destroyed 46 of them. And of course, Hezekiah being in Jerusalem, that was the last attempt uh, as far as uh, the Sennacherib king was concerned to conquer Israel, uh, Jerusalem. And he didn't conquer it. He besieged it, but he didn't conquer it. Jerusalem sits on three hills. And, and the whole story can be read, uh, of course, there in uh, 2 Chronicles uh, 32. So, Sennacherib, after he tried to negotiate with Hezekiah, and Hezekiah would have nothing to do with him, although he did give him some of the, some of the treasures of the, um, uh, of, the, of the temple, to say, here, go away, don't bother us. Well, to paraphrase all of that, um, Sennacherib um, took those things, went back to his camp at Lachish, moved his army up a little further toward Libna, which is nothing but a a big mound, by the way, that they're excavating. Um, and so Hezekiah is living in Jerusalem at this time with, with uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, uh, <laughs> Isaiah is living in Jerusalem at this time with Hezekiah. And Isaiah says, pray to God that he will go away and that you'll be spared. Well, Isaiah told that to Hezekiah. Hezekiah prayed that night. And the next morning, Sennacherib woke up. 186,000, 185,000 of his troops lay dead on the ground. So Hezekiah uh, was relieved of that. Sennacherib packed his bags, went back to Nineveh. A few years later, one of his three sons killed him. And then he, before all of that, he wrote on his um, war uh, records, uh, and there's a, there's, a, there's a picture of it here, uh, of one of those um, uh, structures in which he recorded how he uh, besieged Jerusalem, and he was very proud of that, but he did not uh, destroy Jerusalem. Here's a map of Sennacherib's uh, campaign in 701 BCE. Starts at the top, way up there, comes down by the Mediterranean, and then comes around, and Bet Shemesh is right there in the middle, and then of course he comes back up and tries to besiege uh, or take Jerusalem, but he could not do that. So, um, 
in Isaiah 1 7, your country lies desolate, your cities are buried with fire, in your very presence, uh, allies are eating your land. So here comes 1990, and here comes Shlomo Bonovovich on the left, who is now deceased, died a few years ago, and then an early picture of Dr. Letterman. Both of these men work at University of Te worked at University of Tel Aviv. Uh, Dr. Shlomo was a lecturer. Uh, Dr. Letterman was a, uh, a lecturer as well as a researcher there. And then here are some approximate dates, different levels of things that they began to excavate and find. And then, of course, you still have this picture with the gray area where all of that was done. There is a cistern there where they collected water. Water would drain down off of rooftops into little uh, canals and then fill this cistern there at, uh, at Bet Shemesh. And you would go down in the ground and, and take a look at it, and it's very, very interesting. Now, there's a, there's a, not the best picture, uh, but that's a little bit, you, there's plastered walls, and that would hold thousands of gallons of water. How would they get the water out? Well, here is a drawing of, uh, of the water system at Bet Shemesh. Remember at, at Gezer and other places, those water systems were, were quite elaborate, and this one is too. You'll notice up here, right there where that person is standing, right down there, uh, that's how they would retrieve the water. And of course, they would take uh, buckets, um, not, like the, uh, not like the bucket here, but what they're holding in their hand and what they find there on the right-hand side. And they would tie a rope to the handle and put the bucket down, just like you would uh, do at your grandmother's well, like we used to do in North Alabama. At the well, buckets on a chain, drop it down and pull the water up. Uh, and a lot of times those things didn't last. The handles would break, and there now then you can go down there uh, years later and you can find all of these artifacts. They told me one day at Bet Shemesh, said, Ferris, I want you to go up to the top of the tell in the 20-foot container where we have all of the tools and everything, because they bring that container in from another area where we have all the tools, and I want you to bring me the Joshua cloth. Well, I didn't know what a Joshua cloth was to save my life. So they sent me up to the top of the, I said, well, I'll ask somebody when I get up there. Well, I went up there, and there was just one person there getting, uh, going to the restroom, and I said, where's the Joshua cloth, and what is it? Oh, it's right here. Well, it's, it's, it's a cloth, as you can see, and it was on a long PVC pipe, all rolled up. I said, okay. So I threw it on my shoulder, went down to, I didn't know what it was going to be used for. So I went down to the bottom of the, of the dig, and I gave it to, to Dr. Manner and some others, and uh, they had some students to stand along and hold that Joshua cloth up. The sun is to their back. Remember how Joshua prayed that the sun would stand still in that battle that he could finish in the Old Testament? So the Joshua cloth is making the sun stand still so they can take pictures of the dig site. <laughs> so there's your Joshua cloth. Here are some pictures of an olive press um, that was discovered. Um, here's a drawing. We've seen this before, the olive press and how it would work. We have found five olive presses at Bet Shemesh. Also, we have found some graves, and this is one of them. And you can see over here in the lower right, uh, there are some items laying on that, on that ledge. They would lay the body there until the, body would, uh, the flesh would rot away. Then they go in and collect the bones. 18th, uh, 8th century pottery that's been found. And of course, we've already talked about the upper left before with the lamellic handle, the stamp, the uh, handles that Hezekiah put on a lot of uh, storage jars, uh, that things that would inside that would belong to him. Belonging to the king is what it means, lamellic. Iron Age remains uh, there at Bet Shemesh. This is a patrician house. This was a very rich rich house there at Bet Shemesh. Whoever lived there had some wherewithal because down the lower right are some pieces of gold that have been found there at Bet Shemesh. Um, very interesting. Then of course you have the, um, uh, you have the pottery. You can see the uh, uh, jars there. Dr. Letterman on the left. Dr. Slomo on the right. You can see some of these things, and you'll see down here 
right here in the lower left, I brought one of my Israeli lamps in, and that's exactly what those are. And then you have little juglets over here, brought one of those in, and then all of this pottery, it wasn't found like this. It was found in pieces, and it takes time to put all this together. And you'll see at the top where you, you have the stopper that would go in the top, and then, of course, the handles on the pottery that we've talked about uh, before. Here's another picture of it, um, a little bit closer. Very beautiful, beautiful pottery. You learn a great deal. You find a lot of pottery in every archaeological dig, biblical dig, that is, I'm talking about. And the pottery can tell you a great deal about that site, about that culture. Um, can't tell you everything, but it'll tell you a great deal about it. More of that beautiful pottery. And then, of course, here's a picture of the different levels, all the way down to the bottom, the, the uh, uh, metal bronze city wall, and then as you go up, because as you go down, you go to different levels, different civilizations, and so forth. Now, Bet Shemesh is interesting because when you go to Bet Shemesh and you look for pig bones, you'll find them at these archaeological sites, except you won't find any at Bet Shemesh because the Israelites weren't allowed to eat pork. And so you'll find a lot there at some of the other sites, especially there in, uh, at, at uh, the Philistine sites. And then, of course, in the late Bronze Age, you'll find more of those pig bones at those sites. And then, of course, you'll find the strong wall that Dr. Letterman tried to find in a very unusual way that you don't use when you go there. Uh, he had a backhoe. You don't, find, you don't excavate with a backhoe. But anyway, he did use it for that one time. McKenzie, when he excavated in a lot of ways, they would tunnel in to the dig site. Well, that's very dangerous because, <laughs> you know, whatever's on top of you could fall on you. And uh, that's not done today. That's a different, different uh, way to excavate. The fortifications, this is just after three seasons. You discover a lot of things. And then, of course, the water system. Here you have an, in, an individual brushing the wall. It's called articulating the wall. You'll notice that there's not any dirt or debris in among those rocks. And that's when you want to take your pictures. Of course, now they use a drone to take pictures. Before, they'd stand on an 85-foot ladder, a huge ladder, and look down and take pictures and get the Joshua cloth out to hide the sun so the glare wouldn't be there. But um, you want to articulate the walls because that's, they're going to show up much better. Let's go on very quickly here. Let me clip through some of these. This is an interesting uh, piece. Over here on the right is a game piece. Now, we, we play Monopoly. We have little game pieces. They did the same thing back 3,000 years ago. And on the right is what is said, Hanan. Same thing over here uh, when they discovered some uh, pottery with writing, Ostrakhan, and so forth. And here's another picture of that, um, of that game piece with the name Hanan. Well, in the Bible, in 1 Chronicles 27, 28, uh, over the oil and sycamore trees is the Shephelah. In the Shephelah was Baha Hanan, the Gedarite, and over the stores of oil was Joash. Well, that's an interesting, does that fit? Well, was that that same person? Well, we really don't know. We really don't know. But here you have a commercial area where some pottery and other items have been found and uh, kind of see how all of that works. All of this painted pottery is Philistine. Remember, Philistines and Canaanites painted and decorated their pottery. Israelites did not. Their pottery was not decorated at all. Here you have that lamellic handle that shows up very, very well in that picture. And here's a close-up of that lamellic handle belonging to the king. Now, they find these things. They take them to the University of Tel Aviv, and they got to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Well, you can see it's not an easy task in doing that. There's Dr. Shlomo putting together a big storage pot with masking tape. He'll put that together. Is that the, is, does everything there fit? Is it in place? Well, we hope so because they'll need to permanently secure that, that those pieces on that pot, but they will use Elmer's glue. Elmer's glue. Because if it's incorrect, they can easily break it off and change it. They wouldn't use super glue at all. And then here's uh, Dr. Letterman's daughter and some of the beautiful um, pots uh, over the stores of oil that would store oil 
was Joash. Uh, those pictures again, of course. And then as you're excavating uh, Lamelic jar handles in the destruction area, uh, you'll see some of these things. And you'll see how it has to be. See this item right here in the middle? That, that's full of soil. It's full of dirt and all that stuff. So you, you've got to be very meticulous and you're on your hands and knees a lot, <laughs> as some of you know. Um, uh, wine set, notice the strainers. This is a wine set from the Israelite area. Did the Israelites strain their wine? Well, this might be proof that they did. Uh, at there at Bet Shemesh, the largest blacksmith shop has been found in all of Israel is at Bet Shemesh. And here are some of the items that have, that have been found there. Uh, they're peeling off, of course, the, the floor very meticulously. It's, it's slow work, to tell you the truth. Uh, it's not fast and quick. And then, of course, there at the iron shop, workshop, you'll find all sorts of things as he sweeps the floor, getting ready for uh, some pictures. And then, of course, you'll have the more of these levels that are found. And then you'll have a chart, like the one in the blue, about three down. Uh, you'll have the uh, century there the dates, the period, so forth and so on. And these will have to be made and records very meticulously kept. Uh, here you have a donkey burial. We talked a little bit about that before. That was found there at Bet Shemesh. Let me read you something very quickly uh, from, the, from the Bible and what, the, what, what God required. God required the firstborn son on every hand to be redeemed. The Lord rejected, of course, human sacrifice. And yet the firstborn son of every Israelite family was special to the Lord. That son was to be devoted to the Lord to a life of service in the tabernacle. However, the Lord chose the tribe of, of Levi, as we know, to do this work as a substitute for the firstborn sons and other tribes. And so the young lads of all other tribes were redeemed from the work which was transferred to the Levites, redeemed for five shekels of silver. Instead of the eldest son of every family in Israel devoting his life to service in the uh, tabernacle, the whole tribe of Levi was set apart, of course, for this work. Now, uh, the law concerning clean animals and elder sons, there was one more law concerning the firstborn, and that was the law which concerned the firstborn unclean livestock or donkeys. What to do with a donkey? Could it not be sacrificed at the tabernacle? Well, it's unclean blood. Could not be sprinkled on the holy altar. It's unclean meat. Could not be eaten by the priests and their families. So what do you do with the donkey? Well, the Israelites had to choose. If he wanted to keep it, after all, donkeys, of course, are very important animals of beasts of burden. He, and if he wanted to keep the donkey, he could redeem it with a lamb. He could, uh, and then would have to bring the lamb to the tabernacle for sacrifice. The lamb would have to die in the place of the donkey. If he did not want to sacrifice the lamb, he had no choice but to break the donkey's neck, and he had to kill it. This donkey's neck is broken, the back is broken, and that was found at Bet Shemesh. Now, there's still a lot of information about that that we don't know. Uh, Dr. Manor has written a paper on this donkey, and it's an interesting study, believe me. Sometimes you've got to improvise. You want to take a picture? Well, let's put the camera on this, on this wooden pole with a PVC pipe, and let's walk on the box, the walls, of course, where the sandbags are so you don't break down the walls, and let's try to take a picture of all this destruction here. This is part of a wall that Sennacherib destroyed. You can see how red it is. They want to take pictures of this uh, before they even begin to move any of this material. This is what you do. You're on your hands and knees, and you're using the petish and a trial right there in the middle, and you are excavating next to a wall. When you do look at what you might find, there's two objects here. Looks like two handles. Well, you excavate out here and work your way in. You don't work right on top of that object. We'll have to end. Dr. Slomo, every afternoon, gave us pottery reading. He would take that pottery, he would brush to the side the useless pieces that we could keep, and then he would take the diagnostic pieces with different shapes and so forth, and he would tell us what it is and exactly what it looked like. And, of course, you've seen some of this when I brought in, and that's Philistine pottery. An iron, an arrowhead, beads, uh, a crater that was found, an uh, outstanding piece uh, that was found there and put back together, uh, a chalice, 
uh, and so forth. Uh, Dr. Manner was one that found this years ago, uh, back in the early uh, 2000s, as that uh, uh, belonging to a priest. If I remember correctly, there's my petition, and here's those areas where we excavated, kind of give you the size of all of that. So this is what you run into, even mud brick that is there that has to be categorized before it's tossed away. And of course there you would find uh, seeds, uh, perhaps lentil of some sort. You would tag every object. And of course when you went to get draw water, uh, many times the handles would break like we said earlier. A stopper, an ax handle, and um, that's in uh, Rachel's hand. I was near the person that discovered that and uh, that ax handle could, uh, could do some still do some chopping. Uh, blade, I should say. Uh, there you have a uh, sling uh, ball. Uh, there you have a piece of pottery detecting uh, a woman and a lot of people. There it is again, a, another piece here. There's a whole story behind all of this because we believe that an Egyptian woman ruled that area. This is, at a, this is a woman. She's holding two lotus leaves uh, in her hands and she has the Egyptian headdress on and all of that. And that's the way it was found in those pieces. And then here's a drawing of it. But this drawing is incorrect because over here, you'll notice on the right, she is standing on nothing. Over here, they have her standing on some sort of a pedestal. And there's some controversy about that uh, as well. An Egyptian, uh, 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 I forget what you call those things, uh, uh, but it depicts, and I've got the paper on it here we could read. Cartouche, thank you. Egyptian cartouche, and it, it depicts, but it's upside down. So when they took the picture, uh, it has to be turned around. Um, and then other things that have been found, and we'll stop right there um, at that point. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed some of this. Archaeology does illuminate the Bible in so many ways, and um, I look forward to bringing some more in the, in the months and months ahead and so forth. Uh, in June... The latter part of June, Marge and I will be in Malden, South Carolina, and I'll be bringing a series of lectures to uh, the church up there, uh, not only like a gospel meeting, but also they want to learn more about all of this material. And so we'll be bringing, a, a, I think, five different lectures. Margie has a ladies' day on that Saturday, so we'll be gone um, in the latter part of June uh, for that gospel meeting and learning more about how... Uh, archaeology illuminates the Bible. We solicit your prayers. Uh, let's pray. It's past time. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for each other. Thank you for the encouragement that we receive from one another. Thank you for the Bible, like we said, the eternal truth that you've given to us. We pray that all of us will be diligent students of your word. Be with us now. Help us to remember many that are in our prayers. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
less people than I thought, you know. Very, very true. Yes. Good evening. Good to see everybody here. We uh, we have a few announcements we'll get started with, and um, uh, I don't see it on this announcement sheet, but uh, be praying for the the shootings in Texas and and uh, those others that were going on as well, but. Um, Faye Toller has moved to Hillview Terrace on Perry, uh, Perry Road, is that Perry Hill Road maybe? Um, room 304 for a few weeks of rehab. Uh, Missy Jones' surgery was successful this morning. Is that, was that this morning? No, that was this morning, okay. And uh, the prognosis was good, so I'm glad to hear that. She should be at uh, St. Vincent's in Birmingham for three to four days. Uh, Pam uh, Brenneman had a successful disc surgery yesterday at Baptist South and seems uh, it may have been the cause of her leg issues. So we're, we're thankful that there's some relief there. Tammy Stidman is home recovering well considering everything. She may, uh, she may learn testing results in 10 days or so. Grace Wright is back home and feeling better and to this, um, this week's prison ministry hygiene need is toothpaste. Well, are there any announcements that, uh, that you'd like to bring up or any prayers that you'd like to uh, uh, include? Well, all right. Um, in our study of the most famous sermon known to, in history, and that was uh, one that Cecil May said, you know, 10 or 15 years ago? No, we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we are ready to exceed the religion of the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees, whatever that means. And, and so uh, at any rate, we plan to find out. We plan to dig in and understand what Jesus meant by that. Jesus will definitely tell us in this sermon and go even deeper in his ministry into what it means to exceed their righteousness. To recap where we are, Christians, as they would later be called first at Antioch, are going to be happy being Christ-like. Now, we haven't uh, mentioned, mentioned it in that term so far, but uh, make no mistake, that's exactly what we're talking about, being Christ-like. And we found that actually Jesus was describing himself in the Beatitudes. We, uh, we have the commands... We know that's what Christ is uh, expecting us to uh, attempt to do, but he's really, he's describing the master teacher himself. He's describing the purity of God and man uh, in the man form. And he, uh, he described the perfect individual, of which company none of us have kept, nor Adam, nor Abraham, nor Moses, or John the baptizer. We mentioned Enoch. Walking with God, no, he still wasn't uh, abil the, able to be called um, uh, that perfect individual. And we've seen these uh, same Christians, in other words, the citizens of the kingdom, we've been referring to them as the citizens of the future kingdom of Christ, are virtually important to the guidance and preservation of the entire world. Very, very fascinating to me. Some of the only Christ some people or some folks will ever experience will be through contact with Christians. And that's, that's a sad thing, but it is a true statement, and, and we have neighbors that probably fall into that category. Thankful that you are their neighbor if you're a Christian. And Jesus spelled out how important they will be in his kingdom. 
And we also know that the law of Moses would not be at odds with Christ. Did he come to uh, abolish the law? No, he came to fulfill the law. In fact, he would declare that seemingly perpetual law finished, completed, finalized, if you will. And so far we haven't brought out the obviously uh, well-read verse in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 14. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of degrees against us and which was hostile to us, New American Standard Version. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Ah, there it is. That'll make everything a lot more understandable and clear up the confusion that the witnesses to the cross must have, have had. It is finished. That, that's just amazing to me. Now, maybe some that weren't, uh, weren't really all that confused, but, but I believe surely this makes it much clearer. John chapter 19 and verse 30. It is finished. Well, maybe some weren't confused. Maybe some had the uh, full understanding of what's going on, but I don't believe so. On the surface, when Jesus said, it is finished, Jesus could have easily meant that he was about to breathe his last breath. It is finished. But how powerful it truly is to see the New Testament books bring these statements of Jesus full circle. What would we, what, how much understanding would we have? Remember, we, we have more understanding because of the New Testament books that we have to, to compare notes and cross-reference and, and all of that. But how unknowledgeable would we be if we didn't know some of the things that were explained by the New Testament writers? And remember, these first, first Sermon on the Mount listeners didn't have the privilege of full circle. I just can't fathom the thought of hearing Christ say some of these things in these three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and not leave there with maybe asking more questions than they had answers. And I just think that's, that's a, an amazing thing. Uh, but thank God we do have full circle. Maybe not as full as we want, maybe not as full of an understanding as we want, but we follow the, the gospel much farther than they could have possibly. So with that as our background for the last three weeks, we remember that Jesus made a point to emphasize how Christians are salt and light to the world. A side note to this, have you ever considered how funny it is that our eyes consist of salt. Now, I'm, I'm revealing something about Ronnie Kephart, but how many of you, when you yawn a lot, do your eyes tear up? I, I just seems like I'm worse than most. But, and when the, white, the wetness is wiped away, I begin to feel the coarseness of the salt. It even makes me sleepier because it's so gritty feeling. So um, it, that seems like a lot of salt to me. But actually, as salty as tears are, tears, as salty as tears taste, I should say, tears are made up of 98% water. I didn't know that. Um, the remaining 2% are made up of salt, oils, and more than 1,500 proteins. I didn't know all that, according to WebMD. So my point is Jesus said to be salt, not to pour salt in people's eyes. You see? We have the right amount. We don't need any more. We don't need extra salt. Genesis uh, 1, 3, and 4, we see that God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Light is good. 
But be light. Don't put light in people's eyes. Don't blind them with light. We reflect the light of Christ, not our own light. Let's put it that way. And before we dig into the religion of the Pharisees, think about the Old Testament versus the New Testament. We tend to think in religious circles that the two are at odds against each other, as if they are opponents. Why do we do that? Well, maybe they are made opponents by men's opposition to one or the other, uh, or by men being opponents with each other, at odds with each other. But for a concise paragraph on the Old Testament, New Testament dilemma, the, the, things, the two things being at, at opposition with each other, we see this from uh, Kaufman's commentary. Sorry to always refer to Brother Kaufman, but not sorry. I, I just think he's got a lot of good stuff to say. Here is the principle that the New Testament is essentially an extension of the old, minus its types and shadows, plus an elevation and perfection of all the late, its latent spirituality. However, the changes in Christ are so radically beyond anything ever dreamed of by the Old Testament prophets that the true connection tends to be obscured. The law of sacrifice was fulfilled in Jesus' death. The law of circumcision was replaced by that circumcision not made with hands, Colossians 2.11. The Passover gave place to the Lord's Supper and the Sabbath day to the, to the Lord's day. I just think that's powerful. And so to, that's the way I think we should understand that mesh of Old Testament versus New Testament. And Jesus had no animosity toward the Old Testament. We cannot forget, He is the Word. It is His Word. It is His Word to complete or finalize. It is His Word to write the final chapter. And so I, I think it's powerful to think those things through. So now let's look to our, our text, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. For I say to you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, lest we forget, verse 18 focuses on Jesus' fulfilling of the old law, his mentioning that. Verse 19, Jesus warns that the New Testament law that he is unfolding here in the sermon will be kept. They're commandments, not suggestions. And anyone who attempts to annul or encourages others to break these commandments will be least in the kingdom of heaven, and those who teach and do them will be great in the kingdom. So we have a raising of the bar. I, I, I can always, every time I hear somebody use that analogy, a raising of the bar, I think of the, of the high jump. Has anybody ever tried to do the high jump? Cecil, you've tried it? He's, Cecil's tried it. I'd love to have seen that. Long time ago. Well, and, and we, we never got any, I guess, good instruction on how to do the high bar, and, and they had an old setup at school when I was in high school, and we tried it, and it was, it was a, a, probably a disaster looking from the outside in. But raising the bar is what Jesus is doing with the ritualistic Pharisees keeping the Old Testament law to the New Testament Christians. We're, we're raising the bar to this New Testament Christians exercising their new commands from the heart. From the heart. And nothing had changed except that very, that very thing, the hearts of men. King David was chosen solely on his heart condition. And, it, and we're not talking about a, a, an AFib. We're talking about his, his mentality and desire to be after God's own heart. But think of it, though. Have you ever considered what Christ is asking them to do? Have you ever considered comparing your religion to Randy Medlin? Is it fair to talk about people who are not in the audience with us. Compare your religion to 
Cecil May. Well, so we got Cecil in the audience with us. Is it, is it fair, Brother Cecil, to compare your religion to N.B. Hardeman or Guyan Woods or Jerry Jenkins or Ira North? You, you pick your person that you held in high esteem or, you, or people have held in high esteem in the church in your lifetime and put yourself in the shoes of the first Sermon on the Mount listeners who were there for the live concert of Jesus on his first sermon early in the ministry and exceed your leader's righteousness. Imagine. Exceed your leader's religion. How will we do that, Jesus? Do we have, and this is just a question that I have, and it's a, an observation maybe, do we have biblical commentary of the common Jewish worshiper complaining about his Jewish leadership? I don't know the answer to that. I don't remember anything. We, I assume they were not oblivious to the things that were going on to the attitudes, to the unfair laws. Um, I think it's interesting that Jesus made a point to point out the things that were going on by making, get this, this is premeditated, premeditated making of a thong in order to turn over the tables and run the people out of the temple because of what they were doing to the common Jewish worshiper. So I assume they weren't oblivious, but if they were, they are being enlightened now. Here we have Jesus shining light, pointing to those Jewish leaders and making it obvious for all to see. I don't have that much uh, intestinal fortitude. Maybe I don't have enough knowledge to be able to do those things, but I think it's very interesting. And we definitely have Christ's description of their religion. He implied it, maybe even alluded to it here in Matthew 5, of course. They are not good role models. And that's, there's the, the summer, summary of what we're talking about. And let me ask you, if, if we had but this one verse from, from Christ, might we conclude the same thing? They are not good role models. Yes, well, that's exactly what we would conclude. But one thing about studying the Bible, to understand God or, and to understand His Word correctly, we must exhaust all those passages on that subject in order to get a full picture of what Christ or God is uh, trying to help us understand uh, on the topic we are researching, whatever it is. And so since we have more than just this one verse... Be sure to read other related verses to get the full context or the, or the understanding. So here's an example, Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 to 39. What kind of religion is Christ describing here? Here we have his uh, rendition or example in verses 38 and 39. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, and I just... I, I may be reading more into this, but it just, seem, just seems like there's a, a real attitude in their voice. Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. If they really understood that this is God in the flesh, would they have come out with such a statement as this? Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign shall be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. And you can read further. But the, but the point is made. But interestingly enough, they asked for a sign right after Jesus taught this in the previous verse. Verse 37, For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. How, how crazy does that seem? It cr seemed crazy to me that he just got finished saying, you will be condemned by your words. Teacher, we want to see a sign. 
That's amazing. Question, why would the Pharisees be called adulterous? Israel was called the same when they offered sacrifices to idols. And just what was involved in offering sacrifices to idols? Well, as far as Molech was concerned, they were offering their own children into a furnace. Not much uh, unlike some things going on today. And another great corroborating passage Christ gave us, and maybe even is there the best one, you know, when you're talking about God's Word, but that Christ gave us to see just what kind of leaders the scribes and Pharisees were. Matthew tw chapter 23. You pick which part of it you want to focus on. There's so many. Which one will be more clear to you? It's all chock full of, of things that Christ describes about them. Here's a couple of that I thought of. Do what they say they are in authority under the Mosaic law. He didn't really say it in those words. He said they, they have seated themselves in authority or in Moses' seat. But he says, do what they say because of that, but don't do what they do. Don't do what they do. Poor role models. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 13. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from men, for you do, you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. What a condemnation. I would be shaken in my boots if I thought that God just said that about me. Closing the door to safety. Imagine, imagine the door of the, of the ark being closed and, and the church is the ark, right? The door of the ark being closed and I'm trying to keep people from getting in there to safety. That's a sad, sad state of affairs. Can you imagine that kind of truth-telling preaching if it were to go on today? Imagine. Well, the third thing, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 24, and he said this more than once, you blind guides, you blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. I'm assuming the camel is not meant to be eaten. Neither was, were the gnats, but you see the point he makes. Poor role models. Christians, be good role models. What our children see us do, they will do. Now, am I saying I always do the right thing? Not at all. But it is like everyone else. I'm a work in progress. I don't know who is not. But back to our question that we asked Jesus, how do we exceed the righteousness of the Jewish leaders? So don't, and, and don't mistake this next verse, verse 21 and following, as, as another rambling. We're going to look at verses 21 and 22 next in chapter 5. Don't mistake this as just a rambling or disjointed or out of place statement. I almost thought that in times gone by. Uh, but, but studying this in a, in a deeper way like we are, you can see that things are tied together very closely. So look at Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever shall say, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Here we see Jesus raising the bar. You've heard it was said, don't, don't do murder, do not kill. Is he, is he discontinuing that law? to say the least, right? He is bringing it more to the true understanding of that law. Be sure to keep this connected to that surpassing the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. This passage is connected 
completely with that. It's a content continuation of the same thought. The New Testament tells us very little if we don't glean from it the image of the high and mighty Jewish leaders bearing hatred in their hearts. For instance, Matthew 23 bears that out over and over and over again. But you tell me, can a person be a full-fledged hypocrite, Christ's word, not mine, and be, let's say, pure in heart? What about meek and gentle? If you're a hypocrite, can you be a peacemaker? I don't know, maybe. I don't think so, though. Hungry for righteousness? The bar Jesus brought to the track for us to jump is quite difficult to swallow, even for us. I mean, we've been Christians all of our lives, but still, it's beyond uh, where did he... What, did, uh, what he did here is, is really it goes beyond teaching differently than the scribes. You know, they, they made a uh, note to, to pay attention that he was teaching different than the scribes. It's, it's beyond that. With authority, yes, but it, it has been said Jesus was so bold to make himself better than the law of Moses. Why not, right? But that's, it seems odd for somebody to think that in, in the world's mind, I mean. Is there anything wrong with the law of Moses? Well, Colossians 2 said that the law was hostile to us. But how can the law, the law of Moses, have something inferior about it since it was God-given? Isn't, isn't that what a lot of people are trying to figure out today? It wasn't the law, it was us. And that's a great point. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24, Paul wrote that the law of Moses was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Now, I don't know that anybody understands that terminology today, but, but schoolmaster isn't, isn't the, the, the most important person Christ is. We're in that statement. And that says a lot to answer our question. The law was God's method at the time to lead the Jews to the one who was better. And he's, he's laying claim to it. Something better is here. A great study for you sometime, the, the book of Hebrews, with a thought in mind, no other thought in mind, but things that are better, 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 over and over again. And the master teacher here is going above and beyond teaching. Jesus is starting a new era with this Sermon on the Mount. This is a new era. And no doubt the people listening there started seeing this is beyond what we've ever seen before. If you think about it, the law, thou shalt not kill, it didn't prohibit hate. Now maybe in its, what's the word? I can't think of the word I wanted to say. Maybe in its scheme or its design, because you think about it, I mean, the, the, the thought of hate crimes today sort of makes me cringe. If you kill somebody, is not hate involved. It is. But hate is the cause of killing. And the Pharisee could keep the commandment and keep it to the letter of the law, but wish some evil fall on his enemy. Uh, I, I read one commentary said uh, he, he could wish that a snake would bite or lightning would strike his enemy or whatever. Therefore, Jesus exposed the weakness and the sinfulness of such a mindset, making hatred equal to murder. Here we have to bring it to, a, to our time now. Have you ever hated someone? Maybe the stereotypical grandma or Aunt May or whoever would, who would never say an unkind word about anybody. You, you've had those people in your family, right, or 
or your neighbors or something, they would never say an evil word about anybody. They would always refrain. Maybe they never had, had any hate. Maybe. But I'd say the majority of us have had somebody we hated. We detested them. If we're honest. But wait, I'm not a murderer though. Christ makes us think twice, you see, about that space between our ears. Makes us think twice about it. Makes us, use the word again, cringe a little to think, you know, I really don't like that person to a higher degree than I should allow myself to go. Christ makes us think about that space between our ears. What's more, he made derogatory statements and labels punishable on par with murder. Now, we want to make that list three things, three things that he lists. But is that all that he's talking about? If we really examine ourselves, how guilty are we? What terms did Christ include in his short list? Raka. Well, I don't understand that word, so I have to look it up too. Raka equals empty-headed, good for nothing, good for nothing. Have you ever said that somebody was an idiot? How's that any different? The word fool, I, I pulled up Strong's Concordance just to see where does that word come from. Probably it's from the base of uh, uh, Mysterian. Don't know if that's the right pronunciation. Which means dull or stupid. Dull or stupid. And then parenthetically, Strong says, as if shut up. He threw that in there to explain just how wrong this word was, to say, you fool. In other words, um, someone who is a blockhead, absurd, fool or foolish or foolishness. So raka and fool have no real difference between them definition-wise. Here's, here's another commentary from Kaufman. The expressions are equally the same are essentially the same. And the plain teaching of, of our Lord in this context is that the results of every kind of sinful and, and that all our derogatory and, and derogatory expressions against one's fellow human beings are murderous. Those who resort to the use of such expressions are guilty in the eyes of the Lord. This is true because such expressions find their origin in a heart full of hatred and enmity. In the light of this, who could use such a term as the N-word? That was what Kaufman brought out. Who could use such a term as that? To set it not a fellow creature made like ourselves in the image of God. Powerful. That's powerful. Though it may seem like these judgments are, are graduated in severity, really Jesus is making a point that all of the foul things we might say against another are wrong and in dire judgment for against us. But the next verse emphasizes what's really important. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, and, and I don't want to take away importance of what we've already studied, but I think it's interesting this, what he says in Matthew 5, 23 to 26. Matthew 5, 23 to 26. If therefore you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way, in order that your opponent may not deliver you to the judge and the judge to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you shall not come out of there until you have paid the last cent. And I read a verse like that and I say, I want to ask you the question, is, is worship important? 
Oh, absolutely. Everybody in there is going to agree. It's absolutely important. Well, let me pose a scenario to you. You are uh, under a huge stress at home on Sunday morning. Really, if you want to be quite honest about it, there has been some quarreling involved. But the show must go on. You pull into the parking lot and you're still fighting or, or the silent tre treatment is happening. You're pressed for time, so you slide in on two wheels and just in the nick of time. And the fa family jumps out and, and the greeter welcomes your smiling faces into the building. But you just have been fighting and things, there's animosity there but in the family. So what's more important? Well, here's, here's another caption that you might, might like. It is at this very juncture, relations with fellow humans, that the Christian is different from others. He is even denied by his Lord the right of worship if his brother has anything against him. This, this scenario is one of those times when I'd like to hear God's clear direction on, on what to do. Do I go in or do I go home or do I, what do I do? But actually, he just told us. He, the passage is clear. It's not hard to understand, not ambiguous. He told us which one's more important. Families are going to have disagreements, not Renee and I, but other families, you know. So, but what about our other, our other people that we have hurt? or that have hurt us? Do we, have we been just going along to get along? Have we just gone on with the show? It's useless to offer worship, Kaufman wrote. It's useless to offer, offer worship to God when some brother has been wronged and insulted until the would-be worshipers shall seek out the one wronged and make amends. Christ's plan of maintaining harmony and fellowship in His church is really quite simple. It is go. Go. Three definite situations are outlined in which it is imperative that the true follower of Christ go to his brother. These are when a brother has ought against such, such a one, this passage that we're in now, Number two, when such a one has been wronged by his brother, Matthew chapter 18, and when one shall observe that a brother has been uh, overtaken in a fault, Galatians chapter 6. But still, the, the action word is go. Powerful. How long have we been Christians? Decades for most of us in here. And, and the Sermon on the Mount is our wake-up call to return to the first principles. I don't know how many of you played basketball, but if you shoot a basketball properly, your elbow is tucked in tight. I learned that early on, but not early enough to, to be any good. But if you have your elbow tucked in tight and you follow through, before long, you will be hitting baskets. And I learned that as a first principle. And if, I, if I'm not shooting well when I get out on the court, which is never, and, and I want to shoot better, I have to stop what I'm doing, put my feet in the proper position, and tighten my elbow. Back to the first principles. Is it important... To us that God is pleased with our worship? I pity the individual who, to whom it's not important. And I fear there is a danger. We have forgotten our first love we, um, and, and made the show of worship our focus. Where's the heart? We need to make sure we have our heart in the right place. 
And there's nothing Randy can do, nothing Ray can do when he's getting up to make the announcements and, and to lead us in our, in our first prayer. It's nothing that any of our song leaders can do to improve that situation or better improve our worship. They're doing a good job. It sits squarely on our individual shoulders. Powerful. I just think it's powerful. And Christ just spells it out for us so well. And as I look at this, and thanks for slapping me in the face for that. <laughs> as I look at it, I mean, I realize how many times that that happens in our lives. It's happened in mine. Uh, and it's so applicable in so many different directions. It, you would think that somewhere We don't see them when they come up, or we're too proud, our ego gets involved. All kind of reasons why we don't fix something before this type of a, I'm not saying extreme fix is necessary. We don't do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. I've just moved into the, and it just may be that I'll do something against you, and that's tainted. And that way wipes out everything that we have to do about actually loving, and taking care of, being, quote, proactive in taking care of people. That's good stuff. Uh, I, mean, I, just I wish I'd have brought you the microphone. Hang on a second. Let's do this right. This business about this uh, affecting our worship. It dawned on me a couple days ago. I thought I had it. Hello. Let me see. It looks like it is. It's flashing. Does that mean? Yeah, I can hear your voice. Okay. One of the news items of the last few days is that a official of the Catholic Church has denied kneeling to uh, Nancy Pelosi. And it occurred to me then, and it was related somewhat to what you're, what you're talking about here. Whoa. <laughs> It relates to the fact that no human the authority to deny communion to anyone else. We are told to examine ourselves mm -hmm. to see if we are properly uh, evaluating the body, the body of Christ, uh, his literal body on the cross, the, the body, his church, so forth. It comes back to us. Nobody else has the authority to deny us worship. And so that's, that comes back to what you're saying, that it, it's, it's our heart that determines whether we're going to get the benefit of worship or not. That's good stuff, too. I appreciate everybody's comments. We're, I guess we're out of time. Any other thoughts before we close? Thank you so much for your attention, and uh, we'll have a word of prayer as we close out.
thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for seeing us through a, another day and, and giving us the health that you've given us. Be with those who have mentioned and, and that are sick. Um, be with um, the families who have lost their precious children. Um, be with the, the family of the, of the shooter and um, comfort them. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to, to really wrap our minds around this message that Christ has given us. Yeah, we know what the law says, but are we holding on to the spirit of that law? Thank you so much for this new message that these people in, the, in Christ's day surely didn't grasp at first. But thank you for the message or for the sacrifice that made it all so clear. Give us wisdom, Father, and be with those who are, who are um, struggling with losses of life and, and with the, the ailments of this body. And pray that you would um, go with us as we leave this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you all.